I have an announcement to make. I have an opinion. <gasps> Everybody stop and listen. I think I might make an entire video about this, but um, I think sometimes academia discourages research rather than encourages it. In the past, many, many times, I've gotten a really cool research idea and then started to research it and then realized I was stepping way outside my area of expertise. And so I felt that before pursuing this project, it would be very important that I become an expert in that new area before I even venture out. And I can't tell you how many projects have died because I was too afraid to step outside my area of expertise. Because I am terrified of being completely off base. And I've done that before. I submitted a paper and somebody said, uh, you know somebody's already invented this, right? And it was one of my first publications as a professor and I had roped in a colleague and roped in a student and it was really super embarrassing that they were relying on my expertise <laughs> and, and I just didn't know enough and I failed. And lately I have been making a conscious effort to say, I don't care. Very likely I'm going to make a bunch of stupid decisions and people are gonna laugh at me and say, well, duh, you can't do that. But you know what? I'm not doing these videos to be right anymore. I don't know if that was ever my intent, but I'm not doing them to be right. I am doing them because I want to learn things. And sometimes stumbling through the dark is the best way to learn what kind of tripping hazards there are around you. And this time it's more than just my worry saying I'm pursuing a dead end. I have a multitude of comments to say so. From my experience, autoencoders fell from popularity quite soon. People realized that the light layer captures the very rigid representation of the data that does not generalize well. And then my personal favorite, please allow me to dissuade you from running a fool's errand. You only get so much time on earth. <laughs> I appreciate your concern for my welfare. And I'm not, um, I'm not frustrated with these people. I think it's great. I'm glad that they're giving me feedback. And in all likelihood, I will return from this and say, well, that was a complete waste of time, but actually it's not gonna be a complete waste of time because I'm gonna learn things in the process. Because sometimes the best way to learn is just to try and see what happens. And then when I fail, let's all just kindly laugh at me <laughs> and say, ah, oh, you simplistic guy, you. <laughs> Always messing things up, but kudos to you. But the thing is, I would rather encourage my impulsiveness than never get anything done. So with that in mind, let's uh, pursue something that will probably fail. Yay! And I reserve the right to be really, really off base, especially with this one. And that's a big part of why I'm doing what I'm doing publicly, so that people can give me suggestions on uh, where to go from here. All right, so last time I talked about autoencoders, neural networks that uh, basically compress data. And I also mentioned that uh, psychologists have been doing data compression for decades. We just call it factor analysis. And just to review, I actually don't remember what I covered last time about factor analysis, but we often use representations like this, where we assume there is some latent variable or some unmeasured variable that is causing your responses to something. So in psychology, we use like a lot of questionnaires, like how upset are you today? How angry are you today? And basically ask you a bunch of questions related to anger. And then from that, we infer some latent variable, your anger from your responses to these indicators. That's what we call them, indicators. And so that is a factor analysis. And there are actually two types of factor analysis. There's an exploratory factor analysis and a confirmatory. And exploratory or EFA is probably less popular nowadays than it used to be. And CFA has kind of taken prominence. And the difference between them is with an EFA, you give it your data set and then you say, all right, find two latent variables or find three latent variables or four. And it's 100% number crunching. And it gives you some results that tell you what the latent variables might be. And then the other kind is confirmatory factor analysis where you tell it in advance, I think there is one latent variable that causes responses on these variables. And there's another latent variable that causes responses on these observed variables. 
and I need you to evaluate how realistic that hypothesis is in light of the data. And so last week when I linked autoencoders to factor analysis, I hadn't been thinking about whether it was like an EFA or a CFA, but now that I think about it, it is very clearly an EFA. Because what you're doing with autoencoders is you're feeding it your data and then asking it to compress it. And you're not giving it any sort of guidance on how it should compress it. So it links more closely to EDA. And like I mentioned last time, factor analysis assumes linearity and that your data are normally distributed, whereas autoencoders don't really care. But one thing that I have learned since last time is that um, they're really totally different. <laughs> like fundamentally. Because factor analysis clusters variables, whereas autoencoders cluster people or, or observations. Now, why do I say that? Because in factor analysis, you assume that the latent variables cause your responses on the observed variables. And then what we end up getting is factor loadings, which are basically regression weights that estimate the strength of relationship between the latent variable and the observed variable. Whereas in autoencoders, each row is pushed through that encoder. And so what we end up getting is we get a compressed code for each observation, not each variable. So fundamentally, that seems um, problematic. Factor analysis clusters variables. Autoencoders cluster people. But I'm still going to try it. Why am I dumb? Probably, but I think I have a good reason. Because in factor analysis, even though it's compressing variables, there's also a way to extract factor scores. Or in other words, it essentially converts variable compression into person level characteristics. And so my idea that I'm going to start with today is to try to do the same thing for autoencoders. I want to convert the person characteristic, the bottleneck scores, into a measure of the characteristics of the variables. So here's what I'm going to try. And again, it might be a terrible idea. But at the end of the algorithm, we get new variables, the autoencoder scores, or the bottleneck scores. So my idea is that now we have a new column in the matrix that is bottleneck node one, bottleneck node two, three. And each of those columns is going to have scores for each individual. Very much like factor scores. So if we can somehow measure the association between these new bottleneck variables and the existing variables, then we could try to convert the bottleneck neurons into something that reflects variable compression. That's the basic idea. Again, I don't know if it's a terrible idea, but that's the basic idea. So again, that requires us to compute the association or the strength of the relationship between the bottleneck neuron and the existing variables. And so your first inclination might be, well, why don't you just compute the correlation coefficient between the two? And that would make sense if we have linear data, but I am intentionally doing this because I want to explore its capabilities at modeling nonlinear data. So instead, I'm going to use something called mutual information, which is something that I just recently learned about. And it's shortened as MI, which for me, who used to be a missing data researcher, MI means multiple imputation, but it's actually mutual information. These damn acronyms, man. It's like ML. To me, that's maximum likelihood. Everybody else, it's machine learning, whatever. But uh, ML, mutual information, does not require the assumption of linearity. So the formal definition looks like this. Ah, scary math, run away. Ah! And all it does is it basically tells you how much knowing the probability of one variable score reduces uncertainty about knowing the probability of another variable score. And I'm not going to go into the details because I don't want to. Instead, let's go ahead and step into R. And I'm going to show you what I've done this week. So here I just did a quick simulation. So all this is doing is greeting in simulated factor scores. And I'm not going to go into details about how I simulated them, but I basically use standard factor analysis theory created five random latent variables and then used basically regression to create the observed variables with error. And then I convert that to a matrix and then I'm going to do an EFA or exploratory factor analysis. And it's very important to pronounce this correctly. It's fact anal, 
not any other pronunciation that you might be thinking of. And then we get loadings. And so what these factor loadings are is they essentially show you the regression weights predicting the observed from the factor. So we can see that for factor one, it's not very predictive of the first 10 items. However, factor four is. So all the regression weights for factor four are above 0.8. And I simulated them to be something like 0.8. So factor analysis is doing its job. And then I ended up creating a function to plot these factor loadings. So what we have here is on the x-axis, we have their factor one loading score. And then on the y-axis is their factor two loading score. Or in other words, I'm just taking these first two columns and then plotting them in a Cartesian plot. And then there's some other fancy pantsy plotting going on that is color coding things. Now it is showing the items on this plot. And what we would expect to see, which is exactly what we do see, is that all the variables that were simulated from a common factor, which are all the blue ones right there, they should load very highly on one factor, but not on any of the others. And that's what we see. Of course, we're only looking at two at a time, but if we look at two and three, we get a very similar pattern just with different variables this time. So nothing new there. It's behaving exactly as it should. Or in other words, I have simulated data that behave exactly like factor analysis. And then I asked factor analysis, what are the latent variables? And it reproduced what I gave it, which is exactly what should happen. So yay, math works, wahoo. Now, what I decided to do was create a nonlinear factor analysis. And I actually don't remember how I created that. Let me look. Ah, there we go. So what I ended up doing is creating an ogive or a sigmoidal function. And very often when I'm playing around with nonlinearity, I like to create lines that look like this, which is a sigmoidal curve or an ogive curve. I don't know why it has so many names. Um, and then this is the equation to do that. So instead of saying y is equal to b0 plus b1x, like I did with, factor, with the regular factor analysis, now I'm doing y is equal to that which ends up behaving like that sigmoidal function. And so now um, I am reading in that data set, which is purposely non... Oh, and the other thing that I did was I um, made the latent variables uh, extremely positively skewed. And so when I do a factor analysis on that, go through the exact same process, it's way more messy I mean, we can still see what the clusters are, but it's not behaving like before. They were super concentrated in clusters, whereas now they're much more spread out. So as expected, they're not behaving as we would hope they would behave. And that's totally expected because factor analysis assumes linearity and we have violated the assumption of linearity. So of course they're not gonna do well. But now I decided to use autoencoders. So I'm gonna start with the linear and then fit the autoencoder model and then compute the loadings. And then in the background, um, this function right here is not only fitting the model, but it's also computing the mutual information. And so I can look at that and it looks, I mean, the dimensions are exactly the same as they were with factor analysis. And then now each entry in the matrix now represents the strength of the association between the bottleneck factor, in this case, F1, and the item, which in this case was negative 0 0.015999. And now if I do a similar plot, it's not working out nearly as well. And if we look at different axes, maybe we'll look at one versus three. You know, we get better separation there. And if you were to rotate the axes, which that's a common factor analysis trick, rotation, that I'm not going to go into now, but um, in this one, they look good. Let's see, let me do another one. And that one, they look pretty good, but there's some overlap there with the X4s. So it's kind of sort of doing things, but it's not nearly as striking as it was for the factor analysis, which looked like this. Like it was so much better before. So 
despite my wishful thinking, um, it turns out that when you simulate the data using factor analysis and then use factor analysis to extract the original latent variables, it does pretty well. Shocking. But when you instead use autoencoders on data that has been simulated with a factor analysis, it doesn't do as well. Again, shocking. But we also know that autoencoders do better with factor analysis in terms of nonlinear patterns. So let's see what happens when we do it with the nonlinear data. Well, blimey. I mean, they are still clustered together. We're still able to separate them, but we were able to do that better before using factor analysis. And if I look at a different one, it, I mean, similar. I mean, they are grouped together again. And another one. So things are clustering together. And you might be looking at this and saying, well, I can very clearly see the distinct clusters. This is great. You've solved my problem. But no, I haven't because I simulated the data to be ideal. Like there is perfect separation between these variables. And the fact that we can't perfectly disentangle them afterward, that's actually problematic. So, did it work? Mm, not really. It wasn't terrible. But I'm certainly not winning a Nobel Prize for my work in this area. So where do I go from here? Fine question, that. Problem is, I don't know why, I don't know if it failed because I overfit. Seems unlikely since I um, know what the answer is and I have a very large sample size. Could it be that it failed because I'm trying to make it do what factor analysis does? That's very possible. I think that's probably the best explanation. In which case taking this approach may not be best and instead focusing on making sense of the fact that the that the rows are compressed, not the columns. I think that may be the approach that I try next. Or maybe it's just uh, has something to do with uh, what everybody was warning me about, that maybe there's overfitting or whatever else everybody said. I don't know. But regardless, I've got some uh, research to do before the next video. You, on the other hand, also have an assignment, which is to sign up for a simplistics course, baby. So if all this is over your head, um, you might want to take an intro class from me, where I am an expert, not stepping outside of my area of expertise. And I have a live class starting in October. It's going to be the first, first four weeks. I think it's the only four weeks in October. From 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Act now before spaces fill up. And if you can't do the live version, you could always do the self-guided version. And I'll leave links below for all those wonderful things. All right, my beautiful, lovely people. Excellent to see you. Peace out. Well, fortunately, I worked out the math, didn't I? Well, no, maybe I didn't. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, yeah. Hey man, I smoke so much weed, I don't have a brain anymore. Well, that's what everyone else does, and I'm not everyone else. I am me, and sometimes I'm British, but me. So I'd rather be confused than bored. That was deeply philosophical, maybe. What is the strangest name in statistics? Kolmogorov. No, Bonferroni. Bonferroni is way weirder than Kolmogorov. I will take that to the grave. That is a hill I will die on. Scientists aren't dumb. They're just dumb in the places that they're not smart. And I stand by that statement. Is that the solution? Every time I do a new YouTube video, it's a new repo. Repossess my soul. When you find out what kind of code I've been writing, you gonna send me to prison or something. Mm -hmm. And do not forget, my dear, I am merely a mirror. Bow! Oh,